Why hello there, Anxious Cynic back again with another Minimator tutorial. Today we're doing something a little bit different though. This is going to be my five general tips for using Minimator. There's a few questions I seem to get relatively often and I figured I'd make one video for all of the little tips to help you guys use Minimator a little more efficiently. So one of the first things I wanted to cover is the on-screen tools. So let's go ahead and bring in just a random block here. Just a blank block. One thing that a lot of people seem to be having trouble with is these things here, these controls, the on-screen controls. It's also an issue with particles and whatnot, but this is just the one example. Let's actually move this around. Okay. So some people don't have these for whatever reason. I don't know if somehow Minimator doesn't have them turned on or if you've accidentally turned them off. But all you're going to do is go right up here in the top right corner of your work area. You can also see it on if you had a camera. Let's actually spawn a camera in real quick as an example. And let's move this over here. All right. So as you can see now, we have our camera selected and you can see the controls on it. So let's go ahead and select our block. All right. So you have these things up here. If I click this one, the toggle controls, then it goes away. That means I cannot see that feature within this frame. However, if I turn it on on my camera, I can now see it within my camera view. Now, generally, I wouldn't use this. Like, I've never really used these controls within the camera view. I suppose there would be some reason or instances where you might would want to do that. But, you know, it's mainly in the work camera here. But, uh, as you can see here, all of these exist on both camera views. So, just keep that in mind. You can toggle any of these on and off for whichever view you're working with. But anyway, you have this one and you have lighting. You can toggle the lighting on and off. It's not very visible here, but maybe if we turn on rendering, if I turn lighting off, it might be, well, it's not that obvious. We don't have anything to light really. Um, and then here you have particles and you can turn that on and off. We don't have any particle creators in here, but it's the same concept. If you had particles and this was turned off, then that means you would not be able to see particles in your scene and thus, you'd have a hard time editing them. You also have the grid here where you can do your rule of thirds if you need that to frame up. I never use it, but you could if you wanted to. And you also have this one. Uh, I have it turned on for my camera view. I don't know if you'd really need to turn it on for your work view, but this is the uh, aspect ratio. So if your aspect ratio is the usual default 16 by nine, which would be the HD resolutions of 1280 by 720 or 1920 by 1080 if you're going for full HD quote unquote then you can turn that on and it'll show you exactly what the camera sees if you don't have this on and you're trying to compose your your cinematography move your camera around then you may be framing your shots based on the full frame of however you have this window and you're gonna think that okay well that's how I have it framed up but then when it actually renders some of your your screen may be cut off. You may not be seeing the whole thing or whatever. So I always use this. I pretty much keep it on for me personally so I can always know what my camera's seeing. And that's that. So another question I get is how do you animate the background? This is one I actually haven't gotten in a while, but it's something I've been meaning to cover. And what you're going to do is go to the uh, Grafton table rather and you go to the sun icon and it's modify the background settings during this animation. So if you click that, you click create, and it's gonna give you this background timeline. And what that allows you to do is have this keyframed just like you would anything else. So let's go ahead and select the first keyframe. We're gonna go to our background. So that's the one thing about this is it doesn't open up anything. Like it's got this tab for background properties and you could parent it, I guess, if you wanted to. I don't really see a reason to unless you just have a folder that you use to hide things that you don't intend to work with very much. But what you do is just pretty much ignore this and you go to your background on your project properties. And I can change the sun here. Let's bring it down. Maybe we'll rotate it. Let's see. See if we can get in the scene. There we go. Well, that's the moon. <laughs> uh, there we go. There's our sun. That way we can see it. And uh, if I move over to this one, it's back to default, like what it was. So if we play it, you're going to see all this. So let's actually, just uh, for the sake of showing you guys this, where's our sun? Sun needs to come out tomorrow. There it is. All right. 
So we can animate this and have it go on down, maybe? And you see it just does this almost like a time lapse kind of thing. It depends on which way you rotate this as well, I believe, that determines whether or not it will uh, go left or right. As you can see, like the way the clouds are going, it's to the left. You may be able to, to rotate it the other way and have it reversed. I really am not sure. I haven't used this feature a lot, but that's how you can do it. And of course, remember that your keyframes can be changed. So if I put this on instant, then what we'll have instead of that time-lapse effect is it'll go from this lighting to this lighting. And of course, that can be helpful if you're doing you know, changes of scene and rather than creating a new project or whatever to do a day to night sequence, you can just do it right here and totally switch everything up. And that's pretty much uh, all you need to know about that. I would think you could probably alter some of these other settings, but that's the basics of how to edit and animate your background. All right, so another question I get is how do you remove the watermark? Well, for one, when you first get Minimator, you have to register it. Uh, you can choose to pay if you want to, because you can you can donate to the project. But otherwise, Minimator is completely free, so just register it and you know skip donating or whatever, and then you will be able to unlock the watermark feature. Let me get that off there. All right, so what you would do is you go to Render, and you scroll down to the bottom, and there's a check mark there that says watermark if you tack it on or take it on then you will have that little watermark in your final animation if you take it off it won't be there so there you go that's how you get rid of the watermark just one very simple easy solution to that little problem all right and while we're in the render tab here another thing you might want to know is your render settings i think i covered this in one of my earlier tutorials but now there's a few more features here. You have the, uh, what is it called? Ambient occlusion type stuff here. So let's go ahead and turn on uh, rendering. And if I tick this off, you will notice that these little shadows down here on the bottom of the box go away. And what that is, is just ambient occlusion. I think it's kind of a simulation here um, where it mimics actual ambient occlusion. God, I'm going to get tongue tied on that word. Uh, but it's not, you know, 100% legit. So uh, what you can do is alter this to be however much you want it to be. I think I had mine turned down to eight here, as you could see, because I just find that to be a little bit more pleasing, but it also depends on what kind of animation you're doing. You can turn it all the way up or down, and you get all kind of craziness. Uh, and then you also have the power here. You can make it really dark or really light, all these things. And you have the blur passes. Generally, you'd probably want that up a bit higher as you can see when you bring it down it gives you this checkered pattern so it's a very low quality blur pass and you can change the color of course you can make it red or whatever you want generally you'll want that on it, it can tend to make the animation look a good bit better as you can see right now the box looks more or less like it's floating that kind of makes it look like it interacts with the ground a little better you have your shadows you can turn Shadows on and off completely, depending on what kind of animation you're doing. Stuff like that. So, finally you have your sunlight buffer size. That's on gigantic, I think by default, but I could be wrong. Spotlight buffer size and point light are going to be, I think, on medium or small even by default. And generally I would recommend editing with them on the lower setting because especially point light. Spotlight can be kind of bad, but point light definitely is gonna give you some major performance hiccups, especially on a scene that's more complicated than just a box sitting there, which I imagine you would probably be doing. So keep it low, but then when you're ready to render, I would suggest sticking to big or very big if you can handle it. Most of the time on an average animation, if I have ever tried to go to gigantic, it, uh, it freezes up my computer and it's pretty terrible. It can have a very, very strong and negative impact on your quality of life so uh yeah keep that in mind but you'll definitely want to up those before you render and uh so you got this thing here the shadow blur quality we don't really have a whole lot going on here in terms of shadows let's see where our sun is let's actually uh go ahead and do this just to make sure that we can see everything that's going on so here's our shadow right there 
some of my settings aren't default, so the way the shadow looks right now might be a little bit different than how you would have it by default. Um, but yeah, if you do this, you can do your shadow blur quality. As you can tell, it's adjusting it. You have your blur size. All this stuff is just purely whatever you want it to be. Some of it you may notice causes some wonkiness in the lighting and the shadows, so you'll just have to play with it and see what works for you. And you have your depth of field. Um, one of the things that you can do with this is pretty much you don't really have to mess with it. As you saw, mine was down to 1%, but it's 2% by default. Uh, if you turn on depth of field, let's see if we can narrow our depth of field a little bit. Let's bring it down to 70. And let's turn our fade size up just because that's what I do. That way that fade looks a little better. This isn't a camera tutorial. Anyway, so what the depth of field blur size is, is it tells you how blurry things that are out of focus are going to look. So usually default's okay. I usually like it to be a little more tame uh, for a little bit less stark and more pleasing look. So I bring mine down to 1% sometimes. And then you have your uh, anti-aliasing which is something you'll definitely want. If you notice the jaggies here, if you can see that on the side of the box, when I turn anti-aliasing on, it helps to blur those out and uh, make things look a little better. And then you can toggle how much it is. Usually default or more is gonna be okay. So now that you've got the rendering settings sorted out, you'll want to render your animation. So up here on this uh, toolbar, you have export the current frame to an image which is you know just a still frame uh, and then you have export movie suggested to you by the film strip icon i usually export to either m wmv mv mv okay anyway wmv or png sequence uh mp4 and mov for me personally don't work that well with my editor i use sony vegas platinum studio something long name uh, currently and it seems to handle the WMVs better and PNG sequences which is actually exporting every frame of your animation as a single image and then you would have to import all those images into the editor and line them up to be one frame each and it will make the motion sequence but if you don't want to deal with all that just figure out which one of these works best for you I don't really know if there's much of a difference between them I also use the quality on just best and I typically just use the 30 frames per second frame rate because that's what YouTube sticks with unless you want to do 60, 30 or 60. You could do 24 if you want to do like the legit animation frame rate for film, but typically you're going to be uploading to YouTube. So stick with 30 unless you want something faster and then go with 60. Completely up to you. If you have audio, you can include it. If you don't, then don't worry about it. Uh, hidden objects are something I've pretty much never used. I guess if you accidentally make things hidden and you forgot and you don't want to go back and do it when you're at this point, then you can include those. I'm not really sure. I never used it. And I always keep high quality rendering ticked because I want everything to be as high quality as possible. So that's how you would render your final animation. And finally, another question I get asked is how do you import assets like when i release my 3d blocks rig or a uh, walk cycle rig or something like that people go well how do you get that into your animation i apologize for not showing that in the videos relevant to that but we're going to go ahead and do it now with our five tips for my animator and what you do is you go up to this button here you have new project this would create an entirely new project and then you have this one with the plus sign and that is import an asset and this is anything pre-made that you want to bring into your animation you click this and what I have here are the things that I've made this is the uh, walk cycle thing that I made this is my or block uh, pack or whatever you want to call it so I want to import my walk cycle hit open and there it is so if I go ahead and let's go ahead and get rid of this cube here and delete it from the scene and if I hit play that is the walk cycle and camera movement that I created when I made that uh, tutorial. And it just imports it right on in. Let's get rid of this. And you may notice that I had a camera uh, parented. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Parented to the uh, character here. So if I bring up my camera, let's actually delete 
this one. We don't need it anymore. So I'll see this same camera angle that I had parented with them as well. All right, so for a final bonus tip, what I wanted to mention to you guys, if you're trying to do the reflection thing, now I don't know if this works, if it has any impact on the camera per se. I haven't noticed any differences, but if you're doing the reflection thing, there's a tutorial I did recently, tutorial I did recently, that explained how to create reflections in your scene. Well, one thing you may notice if you don't notice this little thing here, um, is that the reflected image is particularly low quality and has a lot of jagged edges and whatnot. And what you want to do is go to your settings, go to graphics, and come down here to camera buffer size and make it as big as you can. Mine seems to work fine on gigantic. And when you do that, it ups the quality. I think that the, the uh, projected texture that the camera has within the scene, it ups the quality so that it looks pretty much just like everything else. And uh, yeah, so if you're trying to do reflections, you want to have a mirror or whatever in your scene, then you may want to have this camera buffer size turned up so that the reflection looks as good as everything else. So that's it. That is the end of this <laughs> arduous journey of five great, awesome tips for Minimator. I hope it was helpful. I hope you learned something. And I will see you in the next video.